Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This is Advanced Insurance Services, Minor Ramos, and I'm joined by Mike D'Amico. And uh, for those of you who may not have heard Mike before, the reason why we have been doing this either webinar series or just a series of videos around the insurance industry is because he has over 50 plus years of experience in the insurance world. And I really want to dive into today, just kind of an open forum. So you you might be uh, someone who is considering being an insurance agent, uh, maybe, you know, just got your license or, you know, looking at how many different ways there are to get into the insurance industry. So, Mike, I know that there's a couple of ways that we could do this. I think it would be good for us to to maybe start out with a little bit of the history and, uh, you know, maybe a, a short bio of, of how you got started and we'll go from there. So um, everybody, welcome, Mike Miko. Minor, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I always enjoy talking to you because uh, you, you you know the business so well that, you know, it makes more sense to you than it does some of the other people. But it's it, we're able to present a product to uh, everybody listening that they can benefit. Um, the history of insurance is, is a fascinating field. Uh, and I've, I've actually got into it a little bit over the years uh, to see how we got to where we are. Because as, as you know, and we've discussed, there's all different methods of marketing insurance. But how did it all start? Well, the oldest known records that we have at the moment, and there's a little bit of a discrepancy, and I'll tell you that in a minute. But the oldest known records that we're uh, sure of go back about 5,000 years to the merchants on the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers in China. And there was a number of instances of piracy back then, believe it or not. And uh, the shippers actually got together at one point and said, you know, we can't sustain sustain these losses. And they said, okay, well, let's merge all our material. And if, you know, one ship gets lost, it won't wipe someone out. And that was how insurance got started. It was on commodities. Uh, and one of the discrepancies is recently in Egypt, they have found records of the same type of thing where people who were shipping merchandise and receiving imports from all over the world as far back as four or 5,000 years ago, uh, banded together and also helped each other in case there was a loss so that they would share in the profits and share in the losses. Uh, coming up to more modern times, everybody or most people have heard of Lloyd's of London well, Lloyd's of London had nothing to do with insurance originally. Lloyd's of Lloyd's was actually a coffee house. Yeah. <laughs> it happened to be a coffee house where shippers would hang out. And uh, the tradition was when your ship was sighted, there was actually a system of semaphores, signals that were sent from the coast to London. And when your ship was sighted, they would actually ring a bell in Lloyd's and announce who shipped had been cited. Mm. Well, after hurricanes and storms and pirates, they actually banded together and started doing the same thing that both the Chinese and the Egyptians were doing, and that is pool their risk. And that's what became what's now called Lloyd's of London. Lloyd's of London is actually a uh, consortium of, I think it's 170 different insurance companies that make up Lloyd's. And uh, to give you the idea of the power that Lloyd's has had over the years, not just in the insurance industry, but in the world of, of, of uh, you know, of the whole economy, is that uh, when they learned about the Hubble Space Station, the, or excuse me, the Space Telescope, had a mistake when they ground the lenses for the Hubble a number of years ago, 20, 25 years ago, I guess now, they had missed ground because there was a conversion between inches and uh, uh, millimeters. Mm -hmm. and they had missed ground one of the lenses so that the original picture, pictures through the Hubble were actually blurry and not usable. Well, that had been uh, insured by Lloyd's of London for something like $200 million. 
Well, NASA turned around and tried to file a claim with Lloyd's and Lloyd said, well, wait a minute, there's a clause in our insurance policy. There's always clauses in insurance policies, by the way. Contract. That says that we have the right to either pay or come up with a solution. And of course, NASA said, okay, come up with a solution. Well, if anybody remembers back then, we actually sent up a couple astronauts in the uh, space shuttle and they exchanged a packet of lenses to change the one that was ground improperly. And then after that, the Hubble Space Station, the Hubble Space Telescope, excuse me, worked perfectly. Hmm. And instead of 200 million, Lloyd's, by funding that mission, paid 130 million. So they saved 70 million dollars and paid the claim simultaneously. Hmm. So that's just the impact insurance has because that that affects all the economy of the whole world when you talk about numbers that big. Coming a little bit forward into the industrial revolution, uh, insurance companies started looking at insuring the lives of people so that not just insuring merchandise, but what about the economic value of a person? Wow. In the industrial age, we had a society that transformed from agrarian on the farms to cities and industry. Well, part of that transfer, the problem became on a farm in an agrarian situation. If somebody died, all the farmers would pitch in, families would work with one another, and the economic loss of losing a person was very, very small compared to what happened when they left the farm and they went into the cities. Now you had families that if a breadwinner passed away, they had no backup. They had no way to uh, make up for the financial loss. And again, like I tell people all the time, you know, without sounding too cold, we're talking about the financial side, the reality of what we do. Right. We're not talking about the emotional loss of, right. of a person. So all of a sudden, insurance companies came up. Again, Lloyd's of London was one of the first that said, you know, if you have a breadwinner who's making X and something happens to them, we can write a life insurance policy and pay a claim to help the family gap that financial loss. And that was the birth of life insurance, which was probably close to six, seven hundred years ago now in the in England. Uh, there could be other parts of the world, but that's the one that I'm the most familiar with. And that was known at the time because it was the industrial age as industrial life insurance. Mm. And they were policies that were actually paid usually weekly. Some of them were actually paid daily, but that didn't last too long because it was not practical. Yeah. But they were paid they were paid weekly and then collected monthly. And that was what became what was known in the United States as the debit system. Debit. One of the first companies to revamp that whole thing and, and go to premiums being paid directly to the insurance company happened to be Prudential. In uh, 1875, when Prudential was established uh, by a guy by the name of Dr John Dryden, who had failed at a number of different things, uh, he borrowed uh, $500 and started Prudential. And anybody that's been in the industry knows how huge Prudential had become over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, well, you know what? Uh, debit insurance is one way, industrial insurance is one way. What, have, what happens if we had an ordinary policy uh, that you paid monthly? And you could even pay it annually if you wanted to the company. And that's what started what is now called ordinary insurance, which is the basis for every single policy that we sell nowadays. Hmm. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 1982, 83, Prudential calculated that it cost them more to collect their debits than it did if they paid up all the policies. So in 1983, Prudential took every industrial policy they still had on the books, paid them up, sent a paid policy to each policyholder, and they then dissolved the debit system, mm. uh, and now there's 
very few companies that still have any type of collection system. But that's just sort of a very brief history that yeah. brings us to the 19th century, uh, more more of the insurance model that you and I are aware of. Right. So I, you know, thank you for for sharing that. I'd imagine that uh, when I took my uh, state exam or the pre licensing course, um, I don't think that was ever covered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not. Uh, you know, it's just so, for, for crazy people like me. That's all. Yeah, no, that's, you know, and, and it's it's really important because I think there was, you know, you mentioned the Industrial Revolution. I think that around that time, it was, you know, really the policies were still primarily sold to wealthy, wealthy individuals. And I'm sure people's incomes weren't, you know, uh, coming up or wasn't worth it. Maybe, you know, they made, you know, very little money, but little by little, they started moving into that progression. And then post-World War II, I mean, we're talking about the 1940s and the 50s. I think around that time is when um, group policies, right, started, you know, coming into the marketplace. And then the digital age, you know, the 1990s till present, you know, with with the advent of the Internet, you know, life insurance began to, to market it digitally. You know, things look a little a little different than they did back then. But the concept has always had its its basis on a person to person connection there's always a relationship building that has to take place you know before um you know a life insurance contract is 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 presented to an individual and and the company you know uh, makes the offer you know that's kind of what the yeah. difference is when you talk about group insurance one of the largest group insurance contracts ever written was with the US army mm. because during world war 2 every gi uh, had insurance on their life to help indemnify their family if anything happened to them. And of course, you're absolutely right. After the wars, when you see a lot of businesses buying group policies on their employees because of them being used to the GL, GSLI insurance, the government life insurance they had in the Army and the, and the military services. Very interesting. And and, and we will do a, a separate video and we're going we're gonna to dive into the uh, some of the, you know, you, you, actually, maybe you can explain that part. You have the insurance company, then you have the IMO, you have the FMO, you have the broker, you have the agency, uh, then you have the the individual agents, and maybe you can explain a little bit about that. We're going to break that down in a separate video to understand how maybe a newer agent might might be presented, like the the opportunity to work in that. So it's it's a uh, the lead based model. The recruitment model, and then maybe even the 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 captive uh, agent model, right? Um, but maybe maybe dive dive into that a little bit as as to you know what you've seen in you know your years of experience and uh, and how that you know how the, how they differentiate you know uh, good and well, bad. I I can tell you from my personal experience. Um, as you know from other conversations, my dad was also in the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the industry and uh, I heard him tell many people who were talking about going into the industry, where should I start? Right. And he always sent them to the debit or as the Prudential called it, the district. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, number one, he started in, the, in a small debit company uh, in 1954 three or four, I think it was. Uh, and his feeling was that it was the most intense, real training that you could get in the insurance industry. Because if you had a debit, you would have anywhere from 100 to 200, even more families on your debit that you would see at least once a month when you were collecting. And you would find out everything was going on in the family. Uh, I mean, I remember because that's how I started. I started as a debit agent in uh, West Virginia and Ohio. Uh, and I know my own experience in the average week, I could do, you know, five or six beneficiary changes. And then you had certain clients that were centers of influence in the community and you would sit and have coffee with them and they would tell you who's getting married, who's having a baby, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And this is how we did our uh research as far as how you found the next client. Um, so I had listened to my dad talk to many people over the years. So when I decided to go in the industry, that's how I started. I actually started in the district 
uh, agency with Prudential in uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. And uh, all my uh, all my policyholders, the males, were either steel workers, railroad workers, or um, coal miners. So um, had a very interesting and eclectic group of clients. Mm -hmm. uh, I was assigned to a much older debit one time. And by older debit, these were policies that were already in their 30s and 40 years old, at least. And in one year, I had 12 death claims. Mm. And I was a joke in the office, so they figured I was knocking some of these people off. Uh, but it was a training. It was a way of learning the business because, you know, when you sit down with a family and actually have to deliver on the promise, and that's all we're doing. We're, we're, we're selling people a promise. When you have to deliver on that promise and find out this is right, this is wrong, this is not done correctly, and have to work inside of that, it was an experience. It was a training. Mm -hmm. And I know agents, including my own father, who was in the business over 30 years, never had 12 death claims. That's unusual. It is. Uh, so in some respects, my dad was 100% correct. It is the most intense training that you can get. Now, there's not a lot of whole debit companies. A lot of whole, not a whole lot of companies that have debits anymore. However, for people that have that as an opportunity, you know, that's that's might be a way to learn even in today's day and age because there are a few around. Mm -hmm. But uh, ordinary insurance that we're familiar with uh, is exactly the same. It's just more zeros. My dad always told me the only difference between a, a policy with a millionaire or a policy with any of his employees, the number of zeros. That's it. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, uh, I think that anyone who, you know, values history uh, and even your experience uh, would, would be very grateful and thankful to hear this this recording and this video. And then in the next videos, we're going to dive into a little bit more about the different uh, types of uh, delivery systems for for insurance agents. I mean, you know, you already gave them the the background so we'll go with that so thanks for watching everybody uh we'll, we'll do, continue to do our our webinar series and you'll be able to watch that thank you mike minor thank you